Welcome everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with today's coronavirus question and answer with my good friend, Dr. Peter Hogenkamp, who is a family medicine doctor up in Rutland, right, Vermont? Not Rutland, Vermont. Rutland, Vermont. Rutland, Vermont. Uh, Peter and I have known each other for uh, far too long. We actually went to medical school together and uh, Peter's wife, Lisa, was actually in my class. Peter was a year ahead of me and they practiced up in Rutland and Pete's been on before and you guys have have said some very nice things about Peter, and he's a great guy, and he's going to answer some questions with me. Um, also, check out Peter's book. We'll put a link in the, uh, in the show notes to his uh, site. He's, he's written a, a couple books, and he's got a brand new one out. So anyway, we've had a ton of questions. We decided to do it this way as opposed to Facebook Live because like Facebook Live is like getting a fire hose worth of questions that we have like one second to think about, and it's hard for us to really give good answers. So we've had a chance to look at the questions, and Pete, you want to get started? Sure. I was, uh, uh, by the way, I was looking through your website, and there was a ton of great questions. Um, I'm really impressed at, at how people can really kind of uh, process and synthesize this. It actually took me a long time to figure out, you know, which are the best questions to, to answer. Um, but, so I decided on the ones that kind of were current. Um, and, and one of the recurrent questions was this talk about asymptomatic spread. It was recently in the news because um, the WHO was talking about, um, you know, maybe the asymptomatic spread, you know, isn't a real factor kind of thing. And they, of course, then got a lot of heat for that. And then they retracted the statement. But I wanted to make three points about asymptomatic spread. And that is, so, so what we're talking about is somebody who's like, for instance, I feel great right now. But if I were infected with the coronavirus, and we know that 40% of people or so um, who have coronavirus have no symptoms at all. But those people, yeah, so, so we're just talking about asymptomatic spread. And that is, it, if I am as an asymptomatic person have the virus, I'm not quarantining myself, I'm out and about, I'm actually, am I exposing other people to the virus that I'm shedding? So three quick points. Number one being, um, the answer is definitely yes. Asymptomatic people can spread the disease, but it's probably they're probably not as likely to spread it who's somebody who is symptomatic. For instance, um, one of the things that we're learning about this virus is that contagion has to do a lot with the viral load. And, and that is, in other words, you just didn't get one or two particles of the virus. You got 10 million. Uh, and there are actually numbers, Jeff. I remember talking to you about this as well. Um, but there's an actual number of viral particles that, that is kind of considered like the, the limit of contagion. But we do know the more viral particles you get, the more likely you are to get it and to get very sick. So asymptomatic people, because they're shedding fewer viral particles, are probably less, um, less likely to spread it than people who are sick. Wouldn't you agree with that, Jeff? Yeah. And I think the other distinction is that you know, there's 35, 40% of people that have this, like never really get sick with it, right? But they have it and they have this low. Then you've got the other percentage of people that have the one to two weeks or the, before they get sick. And those people have got rising viral loads and they're getting progressively more infectious as they get along and then they develop symptoms. So that group of people is increasingly very infectious. So, fact, and the right. problem is like if I have if we both have it and you got exposed to a thousand particles and I was in the ER and somebody sneezed on me and I got exposed to 300 million and I'm going to develop symptoms and you're not then you know if, if somebody gets exposed to you for a short period of time they may only get exposed to a tiny amount of virus and you're not going to have any symptoms and whereas like if I'm a week into it and I'm like two days away from getting symptoms I might be spilling 400 times more virus than you were and again we're both asymptomatic and so how do you there's no way to distinguish so we kind of have to treat sort of everybody the same way and we've got to take these precautions for everybody because there's no way to tell the other thing about that is that you know we're, we're kind of seeing this question of can you get it again and we think that maybe some of these people that are asymptomatic don't mount that big an immune response and if you don't produce enough antibodies, then you may not be immune. So if you get actually sick with it, you're, 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 you're on a vigorous immune response, you kill off the virus, and you're probably gonna have immunity for a few years. If you have a minor infection, it, it, you never get symptoms, your immune response may be very minimal and you may be susceptible to getting it again. I mean, at, at risk again, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that kind of segues nice into this, this question about masks. We got a lot of questions about masks. 
And as, as, as my friend Jeff tells me all the time, masks are about uh, keeping other people safe. If we all wear masks, we know that masks prevent us from, uh, or you know, greatly reduce the risk of us infecting other people. Um, they're not so good, especially these cloth ones that people are wearing, um, at preventing us from getting sick. But if we're all wearing masks, it, it actually helps the people who are asymptomatic or, or becoming symptomatic. It helps prevent those people from actually transmitting the disease to other people. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you, if you ever like watch those like high speed, like videos of people sneezing and then, yeah. you know, they get a litches, right? You can see like this huge spew of particles that go out. Well, that, you know, that's loaded with virus if you're infected. If, and imagine if you put a mask on somebody, you're going to get some particles that come out, but it's not going to be nearly as much. And so use that visual, you know, be a good citizen. Think about other people. Like I said, put the mask on when you walk into the store, take it out when you walk outside. You know, right. you don't need to be wearing the car. Um, we've also got those questions about like, well, you know, it's going to cause me to get CO2 retention and go into heart failure and stuff like that. Well, you know, we know lots of surgeons that wear masks, you know, six hours at a time and painters and drywallers that have been wearing N95 masks the whole time they're working and, and car painters and sanders. You know, I, I think it's, is it annoying? I mean, I have to wear, you know, in the ER where it, it drives me nuts, but I don't feel like I'm hypoxic. I'm not like passing out. I, mean, I think that's one of the biggest things. You know, there's a lot of false information that, that comes out of these, you know, uh, hysterical kind of uh, catastrophes. And one of the, I think the, the biggest false information um, is, is of all the bad outcomes of mask wearing. I don't know of one bad outcome of anyone who's worn a mask, meaning yeah. that they got sick from the mask. I, I've never heard of one. No, I've never heard of one. And again, like, you know, we've been using masks for, for a long time. You know, I mean, some of these surgeries go for eight, 10 hours long, you know, like, and, you know, is it annoying? Yeah, it's annoying. If, we, if, if annoyance was a medical problem, then there'd be a lot of that from masks. There'd be a lot of really no, no real major medical problems. And, and, and um, I've been actually wearing masks the last couple of flu seasons, Jeff. Um, and, um, you know, I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at China. I mean, and, and Asia, they, they've been wearing masks over there for years, you know, yeah. um, and they, they seem to be doing okay. Um, travel. We talked about travel. Um, I got a we had a lot of questions about people who are either traveling, want to go to the beach, they want to go to the mountains. What do you think? So, you know, th this one that kind of fights near to home because I love to travel. Um, and we haven't done any of it since this pandemic, and I'm really kind of itching to. And so what I would say is, I, I, you know, I think the traveling thing, you just have to look at each individual um, case and say, you know, is this a good travel or, or is this a bad travel? Would I want to go on a cruise right now? I, I wouldn't. Um, I really wouldn't. However, do I think a beach vacation is reasonable? I do. Um, yeah. You know, especially you know, if someone's going to go out to the Outer Banks in Carolina and rent a home, it's going to be clean before you get there. Um, it's going to be you and your, your, your party there while you're there. You're spending time at the beach outdoors. Um, I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. I mean, is it completely risk-free? No. I mean, you have to stop at a gas station on the way down and use the bathroom. Um, at least I do, usually every two hours. Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a safe amount of risk to, to take. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to go to a huge convention right now. Uh, definitely not. You know, I think outdoor things, mountains, you know, we were just at the beach and I, I talked about it in our video. I thought it was very safe. You know, like yeah. you know, we were in a house, you know, I thought people were very sort of, you know, very cognizant of like, of being well, very courteous and, and looking out for everybody. You know, um, I think, you know, my, one of my best friends is, is turning 50 and we've been planning this trip to Mexico with a bunch of people and it's like in July. You know, we've been planning this thing for a year. Do I think we're going? You know, probably not. Do I think it's a good idea? You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I'm, I'm I, don't, I don't think that that's probably a smart idea. Would I fly right now? I think that, you know, if reasonable precautions are taken, I think flying can be done in a relatively reasonable way. But, you know, I don't think we're going to be back to flying everywhere on a whim for, a, for some period of time. For a long time, yeah. For a long time. You know, I think you've, you've got to be reasonable. We've had, you know, some questions about, you know, somebody's got a wedding coming up, um, you know, with 85 people in November. You know, what do we think about that? Well, it's impossible to say, is this going to be gone by November? No, it's not, you know. 
So, uh, you know, I think that planning any large event, there's some, I think somebody that was going overseas, you know, like was going a, like a In destination Jamaica. wedding, Jamaica, yeah. somebody had a, a bat mitzvah, things like that. I mean, I think any of those events, you know, there's no way to tell you, to give you an answer. Like there's, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but you know, if you look at what numbers are doing, they're going up almost everywhere that's reopened. We're seeing rising numbers. As we would expect them to. As we would expect. Um, we know that our overall risk is low of dying from it, but our risk of getting it is, is rising. The fact is we've got to live our lives, and, and it's a, a risk. But how do you minimize those risks? Well, we're going to have to look at these sort of get mass gatherings. So mass gatherings are going to be the things that are going to drive it. And I think we're going to have to individually look and see if you know having a wedding with 85 people indoors is probably if if it was outdoors and it was spread out, then that's fine. But um, in yeah, order- the other point I would make, um, and I agree with you, I think mass gatherings do drive you know this type of pandemic. Is you know, do you want to spend fifty grand or whatever a wedding costs nowadays, and then be fretting the whole time? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, have maybe um, half the people cancel as you get closer because the there's a cancel. spike. Yeah, I mean, if if it's possible to postpone it. Um, you know, maybe just have a small wedding and then celebrate it later on. I, you know, once this has calmed down quite a bit, that would be my advice. That's what I would do if it were my daughter. Yeah. Do something small and then plan on doing kind of a reception later on that right. invite everybody and do it, you know, do like a zoom thing where you can broadcast the ceremony and then say, Hey, we're going to celebrate it when things calm down. I agree. You're going to spend a lot of money and, you know, we, we, you know, we suspect that, you know, it, it, you know, if, if there's seasonality to this virus, we would expect come November that we're going to be yeah, have a huge spike again. And, you know, we're already, you know, we're supposed to be seeing dropping cases as summer goes along and we're seeing the opposite. And, you know, so that doesn't really bode that well for the fall. It doesn't, no. So, you know, there's no way to give people a really good answer. I think just, I think abundance of caution would be, and you know, especially when you're talking about a bunch of money and, and things like that. Keep because weddings are stressful enough. I can, I can vouch for that. Yeah. And then you add on all this whole COVID um, type of, um, you know, extra stress, you know, are people going to come? Are people going to get sick? Boy, that's a lot of money to spend to worry. I, I agree. So I wish we had better, better news. But I think that's a nice segue to, to talk about, you know, you're talking about the increasing number of cases that we're seeing in a lot of places, Jeff, and, and I think we expected that, you know, when, when things reopened, we, we know that social distancing and quarantine works. And those are, that's kind of nice because we were really able to kind of bring the virus down quite a bit, um, especially in like New York, New Jersey, yeah. Connecticut. Um, they really were having a tough time in those places and they really brought the virus down to a manageable level. Um, but now we're seeing the virus in, in places, for instance, in North Carolina, you know, where, where you guys have opened up and are at stage two, we're seeing increasing cases. So, you know, how, 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 do, we, how do we manage that right now? I mean, I, th- I, I know some people that want to shut it right back down. Yeah, and I would, dis- I would disagree with that. I, I, you know, we talked about this earlier that, you know, the harm done by shutting things down, poverty, loss of business, loss of the economy is right. – is, probably on the long run going to be greater, right? Greater. And we also know that the, you know, the, the, the problem with this particular virus is the insidious nature of it, that it's very transmittable, yet has a low mortality rate. Um, but there are pop segments of the population that are very high risk of getting very severely ill. Right. And so, and also it's got a long incubation period. So, you know, people can go around and be sick and spreading it around for weeks without knowing it. So it makes it, you know, you know, and I don't want to say this, you know, sort of blithely, but, you know, if it was more deadly, it would be almost better because, like, if people got sick, really sick, really quick and died, or, you know, we knew right away, like some of the other classic plagues, like the Spanish flu and the Black Death and things like that, where people got sick and they, they immediately, you know, they're, they're somewhat ma- easier to manage because you know who's sick, you can quarantine those people and they're not, and then you can isolate it and lock it down. Whereas you have people that can spread it for a week or two and not know it. It, it makes right. it far more difficult. A far um, more difficult problem. But you know, you're, you're making the point about like, you know, poverty. Um, and I always tell people, you know, poverty kills. And, and the thing about it is, um, you know, who is going to be most affected by 
um, you know, the, the, the increased poverty that we're going to see from, from, from the shutdown of the coronavirus. It, it's going to be the people at the margins of society that are always the most susceptible. So I, I was just listing five programs um, that are all paid for by public tax dollars. Methadone programs, save lives. Domestic violence programs, save lives. Heat assistance programs for the elderly, save lives. WIC, the federal program for women, uh, infants, and children, save lives. Programs for the, um, that, that monitor and, and help the elderly. These programs save lives. And I hate to tell you, but these are the first programs, you know, history will tell us that these are the first programs that governments cut once they're in a, um, a, a you know, cash free fall. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about shutting things down again, I, I think, you know, what happens in those circumstances is that down the line, you end up with a loss of these programs and you see more lives lost as a consequence of that than you do to the virus. Exactly. So I think we've got to figure out, you know, how do you protect the vulnerable? And, right. you know, unfortunately, we talked about sort of the intrinsic unfairness. If you've got a chronic disease, you're at higher risk and you're going to have to really, uh, you know, go to a much higher degree of isolation than if you don't have a chronic disease. And, you know, and, and we've got to achieve, you know, we, we've got to achieve a point where we've got some kind of herd immunity. That's either, you know, everybody's had it or there's a vaccine. And we talked about the challenges of vaccines you know, the challenge of vaccine is a making sure it's safe and effective, which you know is not a very easy thing to do. Uh, you know, I think realistically, if we have, you know, if we get a safe, effective vaccine by, you know, by 2021, I think we're doing pretty well. And then we've got to manufacture what eight billion doses of it, you know, at least, yeah, and distribute those things. That's going to take who knows how long. Uh, and money, more, as you were saying money. earlier, that, that is a tremendously expensive proposition. Right. Um, and um, so it's, it's going to take time and money. So I, I think just to say, all right, well, the vaccine's coming out. Let's just go ahead. I, I think that's a foolish way to look at it. Yeah. So we have to figure out you know, what the middle road is. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, testing. And, and some people say, well, the, raising, the rising number of cases is related to more testing. Well, that's partially true, but you've got to really look at the rising number of hospitalizations because you don't get hospitalized because of testing. You get hospitalized because you're sick. Because you're sick. And just, you know, just, you know, and I think, you know, let me see if I can share that thing I shared with you earlier. So this is interesting. Um, let me, I'm going to share this screen with everybody. This is, um, let's see here. These are the numbers from North Carolina. And what I want to show, oh, I sure we go. Wrong. We got it. I got it. Okay. So right here, um, these are the. This is the rising number of cases. You can see they're going up, and we open up around here on the twenty second. Now you can see the testing here has gone up a little bit. You know, uh, you know, here we were testing like eleven, twelve thousand. Now we're checking. You know, now we're doing like fifteen to nineteen thousand. So testing has definitely gone up. But this is the number you really need to look at. This is hospitalizations. 460, now we're up to eight, 812. And so hospitalization rates in this state, this is North Carolina, oops, are going up significantly fast. And those are the numbers that, um, those are the numbers re that you really need to worry about. Um, it's not so much the rising number of cases, it's rising hospitalizations. And if you look at Arizona, for example, their ICU utilization is going through the roof. And that's where we start running into utilization you know, when, when utilization outstrips supply, we've got limited amounts of, of ICU critical care space that we get into New York situations, which we want to avoid. And so we're going to carefully, carefully monitor this. And with a little bit of luck, we will be able to, to manage it in such a way that we won't have to shut everything back down. Although it may come to the point where there are certain areas of the country where we do certain need areas. you know, yeah. and you know, it may be that we have to designate, hey, listen, things have gotten out of control in this section of the country, we got to lock this area back down for a period of time so we can get things under control. Right, and, and I, um, I, I, you made that point in one of your earlier videos, which was excellent, and that is there's no one-size-fits-all solution for this. We're going to have to look at this in each individual area. So, so like a state like Arizona or certain pockets within Arizona, they may actually go to the nuclear option, which is then you know, to, to lock down everybody because you know, once the healthcare system gets overwhelmed, that's when you really see your mortality rate go through the roof. Right. 
you know, and again, it's about protect, you know, protecting as many people as possible. And yes, that's possible. protecting both, you know, on the sort of economic, socioeconomic level and on the health level as well. Yeah, I mean, if I were in charge, that, that's what I would do. I mean, I, someone asked me the other day, you know, well, if cases go up, we got to lock down again. And I said to him, you know, the original idea of lockdown was not to prevent the virus from ever infecting anybody. It was to prevent the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. So here in Vermont, we certainly went the other way where there was nobody in any of the hospitals. The hospitals had, had record, you know, um, vacancy rates. But what I would do is, you know, keep things going as much as possible. If the hospitals start, you know, getting overwhelmed, then you have to kind of, um, uh, you know, maybe take a step backwards, go from stage one back, you know, stage two back to stage one. Um, try to keep moving forward as long as that healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. But as you point out, in, in Arizona, it's very close to being overwhelmed. Yeah. And so one ICU bed left. Yeah. I mean, like that's a, that's a significant problem. Um, so uh, there's some questions about like dent, doctor's appointments, dental cleaning, things like that. Um, I think that, it, you know, depends on what you're having done. So like dental cleaning is a great example. You know, our office is right next to um, Harris Orthodontics and, and Chris Harris um, is a buddy of mine and he, they've got an interesting system that they do. So they have their patients pull in, um, they park, they've got numbered spots out front and then they text that they're there. And then he has one of his staff members come out, they've got a, a N95 mask, a gown, gloves, a shield, and they come in, they get the kid and they take them back there and they're like, they got full PPE on and they do the brace, whatever thing. The parents aren't allowed to go in and then they bring, they deliver the kid back out to the car. So I think it can be done. Like, I think Chris is doing a very, very good job of it. So I think if you're a dentist or whatever, you know, if you're doing something where it's a procedural type thing, if they're taking adequate precautions, I would feel very comfortable going to that. If you go in there and like nobody's wearing any gloves and like, you know, then I would be, I, I would be concerned. Yeah, I, I, I've been to get my hair cut. I haven't been to the dentist yet, but I, one of my best friends is the dentist and they're, they're going, you know, the whole nine yards in terms of, you know, keeping people safe. And in those circumstances, you know, I, I tell people I would go ahead and do that. Um, uh, so let, let's talk about schools um, yeah. because th this is a huge area. I, I have two school age kids, <laughs> so I'm obviously very interested. Um, I, I'm a big proponent for, for reopening schools in the fall. Um, I, I think, you know, it goes back to the conversation we had earlier about weighing the risks and benefits. There, there's a huge risk. There's a huge negative um, to, to not sending kids back to school. Um, and, and, you know, Jeff and I were talking about earlier, but we understand that kids act as the reservoir of this illness. Uh, we know that, that even though this is a population that doesn't get very sick, we're not going to see that many deaths among school-age kids, that they will transmit the virus to other people. But I think, you know, we have to realize that the virus is here. It's not going away. It's going, you know, we're going to have it for probably at least a year or two. Um, and I think we have to manage our lives as best we can and move forward as best we can despite it. Closing schools, to me, seems like a draconian kind of thing. Um, with, with the huge negatives. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't change, you know, the way we do school. Um, you know, Jeff, you had some, uh, you, uh, some ideas about, you know, every other day kind of thing. To limit, yeah, class sizes, or also to, you know, sort of assess each household. So if, you know, if you're in a household where you've got young kids, you've got young parents, nobody's sick, your parents don't live, you know, there, there's nobody that you're in contact with that's at risk, then, you know, why not let those kids go back? No restrictions. Back. You know, if you're in a household where, you know, you've got a parent who's, you know, immunocompromised undergoing chemotherapy, well, maybe that kid needs to do remote, you know, right. like, or if grandma's living at home, she wears oxygen. Yeah. Like, of. you know, um, and the other thing is that maybe you, you, you do a combination of, or maybe you, you do an assessment like, okay, we've got X percentage of people that are at risk in our pop, in our local population. So we're going to, we're going to do half online, half, you know, live. And we're going to all, you know, we're going to split the school in half and like half the kids will come in one day, the other half will come in the next day to kind of limit the, you know, the numbers. I mean, I think, but I agree. We got to get the kids back to school. Um, you know, my, my son's, my son's girlfriend is a high school senior. Uh, he, my son graduated last year, but you know, I, I just look at what Hannah's gone through just missing all these, 
the kind of things in her senior year. It's just been sad. I mean, like they've got graduation tomorrow, and like we have, you know, the, the Charlotte Motor Speedway, which is this huge thing. So they're doing a drive-through graduation at the speedway, and the speedway's got this, you know, massive like five hundred foot video screen. Video screen. But yeah. every family's allowed to have like one car, and that's like that's Hannah's graduation, and it, you know, it's it's. It's kind of heartbreaking, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, those things, you know, are, you know, school is so important, especially younger kids. Like, you know, how do you teach a first grader online? I mean, like the, I, I have a lot of, we have friends who are elementary school teachers and they're doing a great job, but they've, you know, shared their frustration. They're like, you know, it's not the same. They're, it's they're not doing the everything same. they can, but like, you know, these kids need more than that. And so they, I they, they gotta get they kids back to school. The question is, how do you do it? safely and it really is not about the kids it's, no. it's about who the kids are in contact with and you know, I, I was talking to this one person and she was telling me well you know then it's going to be on your head you know if something one of these kids dies and and i was trying to kind of talk her out of that philosophy because you know people are getting sick with covid they, people are dying every day we've had what one hundred and fourteen thousand deaths um and and that would have been a lot worse had we not shut things down yeah. But, you know, when, when we talk about managing this crisis, we're talking about minimizing deaths and, and, and maximizing, you know, a normal life as much as possible, normalizing the economy for the reasons we talked about earlier. And but 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 it, it means accepting a certain amount of, of, of death and suffering. Um, we're trying to minimize it, but we're going to have to accept accept some. We, we can't exist in a world where no one gets COVID. Yeah. And it, it's not going to happen, you know. It's not um, going to happen. One of the things, um, there was an interesting question about elevators, and we, we talked, we, when we were talking yesterday, we were talking about elevators. You know, and, you know, elevators, like we talked about, you know, infection is related to exposure plus time. So if you're in an elevator and you're like going down one floor and you're in that elevator for, you know, for two minutes and you're wearing a mask and the other person's wearing a mask, like it's probably pretty low risk. If you're in New York City in a skyscraper and you've got to go down a hundred floors and you're on that elevator for, you know, with 20 people like that, you know, for three or four minutes. Yeah, that that could be a risk. Um, and you're, you're probably not going to walk down a hundred flights of stairs, um, you know, to avoid that risk. You know, right. so I think the, the, the elevator question really comes down to how many people are on the elevator with you. Try to, you know, distance as much as possible. Make sure that they're wearing a mask and hopefully minimize the length of those trips. And um, it might be that if, you're, if you get stuck on a crowded elevator, you know, hit the button and get off and, and wait for the next car. Right. But, I mean, you know, we, I take an elevator ride around here, four or five floors. Um, I was talking to this one person who literally lives on the 30th floor of a tenement building down in, in Brooklyn. And, you know, you don't walk 30 floors down to get the mail. I mean, you're just, you're just not going to do it. Um, so those things become a big issue. Her solution was to reverse her life, uh, and that is to, to live at night um, and sleep during the day because then she can take the elevator down in the middle of the night, most likely without anybody there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those, those tenement elevators, like my, my wife's, you know, my wife's uh, family lives in the Bronx, and, um, like, we were just, we were down there, uh, you know, around Christmas time. We went to visit some of her cousins, and, like, they live in one of those big tenement buildings. And, they, you know, those are not, like, the, the normal sort of like elevator in like a high rise, like office building, those elevators are like, you know, Act. tiny, like they're yeah. small. They're and small. Like you're kind of in there like sardines. And so that's, you know, you, you know I think it, it depends on the elevator. You want to try to minimize that. I'm just looking through some of these other questions. Um, we were talking a little bit about, I, I did a thing about, about the vascular uh, idea about, you know, whether there's endothelial dysfunction, and we talked about ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Um, somebody asked about whether, you know, it, hypertension being a risk, is it a risk if, you're, if it's treated or untreated? I, I certainly think that it's a much lower risk if it's treated, um, much higher risk if it's untreated. Um, in terms of taking statins, I wouldn't put somebody on a statin uh, or any of these things if you, if, you know, to prevent COVID, but if you have those underlying problems, you want to be maximized in your medicines. We think right. that ACE inhibitors and ARBs may be protective. I think there's a lot of data that, that, you know, we don't have those randomly controlled trials yet to really answer that question. Um, but I think you and I both think that there's probably, 
some protection there. If you're on those medicines, make sure you're taking them. But neither one of us are really thinking we are gonna, we're going to – we're not going to prevent people from getting it, and we're not going to – I've had that question to me, like, should I start this, this ACE inhibitor or the statin now to, to give myself lower risk? And, and, and I told the person, you know, unless you have untreated hypertension or, you know, untreated hy- hypercholesterolemia, the answer is, in my case, would be no. Um, um, interestingly, Jeff, a, a talk that you and I talked about before, and, and that is this whole idea of chronic disease um, – you know, people with chronic disease are at higher risk for having a severe case of COVID. Well, but the people with chronic disease have been a higher, a higher risk for, for death and suffering for various reasons for a long time. Yeah. Um, this is just kind of a highlighting it or it's bringing it to, you know, people's attention. So I had a guy the other day, we were talking about it and I'm like, you know, I'm glad that you're using this COVID to try to get into better health. Right. However, right. You know, I, I've been trying to get you to manage your chronic diseases better for a long time. Um, so one of the things I think is good about this is that it is bringing to attention, you know, the whole idea of managing chronic illness and, and doing a better job of it. Yeah. This is my lovely wife, by the way. Hey, Lisa, what's <laughs> up? Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Stick your head back in here. Say hi to everybody. Yeah, here. Oh, I thought it was just you two. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Lisa Hogan Camp. Lisa, what's up? <laughs> Not much. So I, I uh, hijacked her office, so she was just coming into getting some uh, to some records there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm trying to I'm trying to put a positive spin on, on COVID and and you know come up with some things that are um, actually good that this epidemic has brought out. And again, one of them, in addition to the fact that you know I I've got people paying now more attention to their chronic disease. I've got a bunch of people that have quit smoking yep. um, because they realized that that. that smoke risk for complications but also i think we're just paying a greater um, you know um, more attention to hygiene yep. um, I, I i had a guy that told me he really never washed his hands in the last 10 years that when he showered he would clean himself but otherwise you know he didn't wash his hands after using the bathroom he didn't wash his hands before he ate and, and this is just how the way he looks so i think we're bringing you know, and, and washing your hands is probably the best way to prevent getting infection yeah, and we, we've talked about, you know, soap kills the virus, and, and so that's oh, a great, virus. you know, that's a great point. You know, we've been trying to, um, you know, my focus here at this clinic is is wellness and optimization, and we, we started a series on, you know, talking about we're starting with weight loss because a lot of people, you know, I went back, you know, to the gym just recently, and, um, you know, and what I noticed was a lot of my friends have put on, not, some mm-hmm. put on not just a little bit of weight, but quite a bit of did they put on the COVID-19 they did seem to put on about COVID-19 and people are, are and I did see as I was driving back yesterday from the gym I, I, I saw a bunch of people that were like looked like they were jogging for the first time ever you know so right. you know but the idea is like sort of like you know maybe we can come out of this a little bit better right mm-hmm. and and understand that we have control over our health and if if we can minimize risk I always talk to my patients about looking like at our health as like, you know what we do in medicine? You know, what do we do in medicine? It's like, it's almost like teaching your kid how to drive by looking at the hood ornament. And in, in traditional medicine, what we do is like, you know, if you do that, you know, when do you know you hit the, hit the tree? Well, you know that you hit the tree when you hit the tree, right? That's not how we teach our kids how to drive. What we teach our kids to do is, you know, look half a mile down the road. And if there's a tree coming, just do that and, and miss the tree. But that's not what we've been trained to do. Like in medicine, we, you know, we wait for the disaster to happen, and then we treat the symptoms. And what right. we really need to be doing is like looking down the line and saying, oh, you know, your fasting insulin level is a little high. And, you know, why is that? Well, that's a, that, that might presage diabetes five years from now. So let's address that now, and, ne- and, and that's this. That's cheap. It's easy. It's a simple lifestyle change, and we never – Develop diabetes, and I've, I've literally had people come to me and say, "Well," and, and they've had like, you know, all the all the, the all the criteria for metabolic syndrome, for example. And I've literally had more than one person say to me, "Well, you know, my doctor noticed this, but they said we, we won't worry about it till you develop diabetes." And you're like, "Ah, ah, like, you know." And so, you know, I tell people, you got to take control of your own health and you got to do these things. And, you know, it's not easy, you know, no, it's it not. can be simple. It can't, you can make it simple. You can't make it easy because you got to do it. But 
you know, you, you got to look out and you got to make sure to make these changes. And so, you know, trying to be as healthy as possible. And it, again, you don't have to eat just sticks and rocks, but you do need to, uh, you do need to sort of do some basic things. And, you know, we always talk about nutrition, fitness, sleep, stress, and oftentimes hormones as we get older. And if you can optimize all five of those areas, what we tend to do is we take performance and health and longevity to the next level. And that's, you know, basic stuff. I, I, I'm using some shark medicine lately, and that is, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes I, I'll, I'll, I call it shark medicine when I can I warn, like for instance, people with diabetes, I'm like, you better take good care of your diabetes or else you might have a stroke or, you know, a heart attack. And I'm finding that COVID is kind of ripe, ripe ground for shark medicine. And, and I find a lot of people coming to me even saying, listen, I really don't want to get sick from COVID. And I'm like, you know, what can I do? I'm like, well, let, let's quit smoking. Let, let's get your diabetes under control and let's lose some weight. Because one of the other, um, I, um, but some of the studies that we're looking at saying that the biggest risk factor for a serious case of COVID was actually obesity. Obesity is a huge risk. Yeah. It's a huge risk. And I, I tell people, think of it like this. If your lungs are a bellows where you're, lung, you're sucking in air and your lungs are kind of bringing it in and the, the diaphragm drops down and bring this air in, if you've got to pump air into your lungs with all this, you know, this extra tissue on the outside, it's just much harder mechanically for the lung to do that. Right. Um, so, but, but I've used that recently to, you know, to get people to take, you know, I think some of these people are going to come out of this in better health than they ever have been yeah. for fear of getting a, a bad COVID case. And, and you know what? That's not a bad thing. You know, no, you know what they what do they say? Never let a good crisis go to waste. So if we can, get, if we can end up with our, yeah, we can end up with our patients being a little healthier. I think the advice for medicine too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's um, a good. I wanted to talk a little bit. Some, someone had mentioned too about like Humera. You know, that they're on Humera. For those people who don't know what Humera is, Humera is a biologic medication that we use against um, um, you know rheumatologic disease, and it's it's very effective, but it's dampening down a person's um, uh, immune response. And you know, these people are at, at somewhat higher risk. I haven't seen um, any significant cases in my practice. I, I've been very lucky. We've had 22 cases of uh, COVID and one of them required hospitalization for a day or two, did not need um, uh, intubation or ICU uh, admission. So I really haven't had too much experience you know, with, with the serious cases. But I know it is it is a risk factor for those people um, you know who have to take these anti-immune medications. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly people that take prednisone for um, uh, to prevent organ um, uh, rejection. But but the big ones, smoking, um, you know, diabetes, especially untreated hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, these these are the things, and if we control them, I, I tell people you're going to feel a lot better if your hypertension is under good control. So let's get it under good control. Yeah, I've got this. Uh, I've got a patient who's been a patient for a long, long time, and um, he's uh, you know like a really high performing kind of uh, you know executive type business guy, and he he just keeps gaining weight, keeps gaining weight, keeps gaining weight. And you know, I've been on him like over the last five years. We probably tried him on a weight loss program multiple times, and he just you know he just never like it doesn't matter like what we do if you don't do it you know you're not gonna get any results and right. so i don't know what it was but for whatever reason he finally you know a couple of weeks ago said dude it's just getting you know it's just i need to do something and so i you know i said you know listen we've done this a bunch of times and i go i'm glad you know we're always here but like you know the missing link is your participation like real participation and so this time he really like he kind of really committed to it and he's doing great and his weight is down and um, he uh, came in early in the week and I'm like, you know, how you doing? He's like, you know, I feel great. He goes, I just, he goes, and he goes, um, he goes, and I remember something you told me a long time ago and, and I totally get it now. He goes, you, you told me that sometimes people tell you that they didn't know they were feeling bad until they felt good. And he goes, that's exactly what I'm feeling. I go, I didn't realize how bad I was feeling until I started feeling good. I feel like so much better. And so he's like really motivated. And, and you know, sometimes it just, you, it's hard to figure out what it is that, that clicks that switch. 
but I'm really confident that he's going to kind of do really well this time, even though we've had like fits and starts over the last, you know, many years. Um, and, you know, so, but he's starting to feel good. He's seeing the results. And so that's, you know, a big part of it is when people start seeing those results, that's great. Jeff, one of my buddies uh, does a lot of dietary management and uh, he's actually a physiatrist, but um, he does a tremendous amount of um, you know, weight management and he's found that to be very successful in his practice. And when I ask him, you know, what, what the best diet is, he always comes out with the same response. And that's, that's one, whatever one you stay on. One that works, um, right. It, it, because the truth of the matter is that almost all diets work. Um, it's just a question of staying on them. Yeah. Um, and, and which is one of the reasons why I, I, I'm a big believer in like the hunter gatherer diet, um, which has worked great for me uh, because I like all the food on it. Yeah. And I, and I would say that I would say give you, I would give you an opposite answer. I would say that no diets work that yeah, no diet diets works. by them themselves are like, you know, an artificial, like I've got to do this diet and then there's like a, a, an expiration, like I'm going to do this diet and then I'm going to go back to where I was before. And what right. I believe is that like you make lifestyle changes and it's lifestyle changes that work long term. And we consider diet a four letter word. We don't talk about diets. What we talk about is lifestyle changes and, and we want to find the lifestyle that's going to work well for you. And it may be, it may work, you know, one thing may work well for one person and maybe something completely different, but it's got to be something that you can consistently do over a long period of time. And ultimately what we try to tell people is that we want you to find something that you can do consistently 85% of the time and then 15% of the time, do whatever you want. If it's right. beer and, and pizza on a Friday night, knock yourself right. out. You know, right. once we get you where you need to be, that's, that's hap you know, we always talk about people want, we want people to be healthy and happy and they're, they're, they're on the same level, you know? And, you know, if I tell you that you'll be perfectly healthy, if you eat sticks and rocks, you're not going to be happy, you know? And if I can tell you, you're going to be perfectly happy if you just eat, you know, you know, uh, you know, ho-hos and, uh, and chocolate chip cookies, you're not going to be healthy. And there's got to be a, a middle ground where we can kind of achieve both of those. Things. I, I had this, um, uh, cardiology professor when I was in um, medical school and uh, he was a, he was a famous guy this was out in Sarah PA remember how we used to have to go oh, to some yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah PA and this guy was great he was funny charming he was very heavy and he, he took everybody out for dinner and he um, he made it a, a point of ordering the biggest fattest steak he could have he drank three or four drinks he had a cigar after dinner and his wife says to him she says honey maybe you should set a better example for the medical students. And he said, you know, if I did, I'd probably live for another year, but it would feel like a hundred, <laughs> which, which was a great point. Yeah. But I went back a couple of years later, I was in the area. I just happened to stop through. I just wanted to say hi, cause I really enjoyed the guy and he taught me a lot of cardiology and I saw him. I didn't recognize him. He'd had a heart attack. And after his heart attack, he changed everything. And, and, I, and I use that story all the time because, you know, sometimes it's easy to be cavalier, you know, when you're feeling good. But all of a sudden you get that first twinge of chest pain and you start regretting some of those decisions. So as you point out, that this, this balance between happiness and healthiness is a great idea. Yeah. Well, dude, I think we got to wrap it up. I know you got sure. some plans this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Um, everybody, Peter Hogenkamp, thanks again, Pete. Um, I think if if people enjoyed this, I know you guys enjoyed the last time we was on. We, maybe we can do it again in a couple of weeks. I think that I like to. this format a little bit better than the Facebook Live, just because like it just felt like we were just it's just chaotic. Yeah. You know, it's just like spending some time with you, Jeff. That's right. That's right. Um, as usual, everybody, if you um, find this useful, please subscribe to the fa uh, to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. Go to Peter's page. I will put links to. Um, your book page, is it better to put to the publishing page or to your Facebook? Actually, just my, my website, peterhogenkampbooks.com. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah. We'll put that there. Um, if I, Hopefully, we got, to, we got through most of the questions. If we didn't get to your question, um, post it again, and I will uh, we'll try to answer them individually um, if, if we didn't get to a specific question. Um, and we'll be back uh, next week on Monday or Tuesday. I'm working the weekend uh, in the ER, so... Monday or Tuesday, I'll come up with, uh, we'll be doing the next part of the weight loss discussion. Um, we're going to be going through all the points that I talked about on Monday, and that'll be the wellness content for the week, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do for the rest of the week. All right, Peter, thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, always a pleasure.